Hello, uh, my name is Chris and welcome to the Training the Community Musician Conversations series. Today I'm joined by Graham. So just jumping straight in, Graham, um, it'd be great if you could tell us a bit about who you are and what is your practice. Terrific. Thanks, Chris. So I'm Graham Sattler. I'm uh, currently the Executive Director of Mitchell Conservatorium, which is a community based and community focused music education uh, organisation in central west New South Wales in uh, Australia. So a non metropolitan city of about uh, 40,000 that serves a population of about 75,000. So we're couple of hundred kilometres west of Sydney, which of course is the capital of New South Wales. Uh, I started off life as a trombone player and moved into singing and conducting and most critically about 20 years ago, uh, moved into working uh, pretty specifically in community music. So both um, professionally uh, running music education uh, programs in non-metropolitan Australia. Uh, but also working at the grassroots level, if I can put it that way, with community musicians uh, and members of the community who didn't know they were musicians, but uh, working very hard on on facilitating music activity um, in and throughout the community. Excellent. Um, it, it, I've always been really interested by your work and to hear much more about it. So I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to unpacking some of these questions. Um, right. So, could you tell us a bit about how did you come to your practice and your training? You've told us a little bit about that, but maybe what yeah. training did you go through, if any, um, on fantastic. that journey to becoming a community musician? That's fantastic. So, I I was trained very much in the sort of the classical uh, formal uh, music education uh, platform from when I was a, a, a kid. And uh, it was really, uh, once I left school, I went into uh, playing professional uh, as a trombone player. So not what you would call community music uh, at all, but very, very much sort of the formal system. And it was only oh, in the late, no, the mid nineties that, uh, uh, well, actually I, from a trombone player, I then went into opera singing. So I was, um, again, this very, very sort of formal classical uh, music world, professional music world, as a, uh, a chorus member of the Australian Opera. So it was all very formal. It was all very, you know, classical based. But around about the mid 90s, uh, I started to work uh, with community groups just um, through through teaching, working with uh, bands, orchestras, community choirs. And I developed a love for that very direct connection to the certainly the musical, but started to tilt more towards the, the non-musical benefits, uh, the social benefits, the um, things like, you know, self-esteem, uh, community cohesion, all of, all of those sorts of things through community choirs and bands, uh, etc. When I moved and I grew up in Sydney, so I was very much a, a you know, capital city boy. Uh, when I moved 20 years ago to the country, I was really enticed by the direct connection connection to identifiable community. That got me straight off, straight away. So no training whatsoever in community music facilitation, but I was all of a sudden responsible as the CEO of a, a the organisation prior to this one, another regional conservatorium in New South Wales. I, I was charged with the responsibility to um, to work in and with the community. Uh, to bring students in, if you like. But I found that direct community as the, the public face and a very enthusiastic one of this organisation, you know, charged with the responsibility to, to build the business, um, I became uh, directly connected to not just, you know, community bands, community choirs, community orchestras, um, but also to uh, some of the other uh, marginalised cohorts. And that, to tell you the truth, Chris, that just got me. So disability cohorts, um, you know, mental health communities, um, seniors communities, uh, early childhood communities, um, Indigenous, uh, Aboriginal and First Nations um, communities, uh, school cohorts that were, you know, uh, children at risk of disengaging from school to distill it over the period from 2001 to about 2009 
um, I just became more and more directly involved. And so then the training, if you like, the small t training came from sourcing uh, uh, experiences of others, looking at experiences of others, becoming um, involved in the uh, in community music um, facilitator group. So I became informally um, connected to those sorts of groups. And then, you know, International Society of Music Education, community music activity groups. I start, I sort of uh, contacts and obviously literature as well. But my training was very much informal. And this is a key for me. My whole musical life to that point was about formal training. And then I hooked into this gorgeous, delicious, enticing, um, informal uh, training myself. And, you know, I moved to the country for two years uh, and 20 years later, I'm still here. So that was my training in community music activity, community music facilitation, community music leadership, community music education. Excellent. It's it's fascinating because for me, my training started in this the same route, that same classical route, and it was, Fantastic. and I always remember that that sort of tra that difficult transition time of realizing that the the move from the in, the formal training to the informal way of learning and developing and experiencing, and all of the questions that run with that, you know, because you can't oh, yeah. start to, you can't stand and practice how you start a session the way you can practice your scales. You know, it was such a fascinating period. It is fascinating. And and the thing that I, I benefit, I think, in terms of training, the thing that I benefited most from, yeah, this is great. When I was growing up, when I was uh, learning the business of being an orchestral musician, right, from the time that I was about 16, I had a tremendous mentor who was a, a conductor and an educator in Sydney but this tremendous mentor, what I, I realized after a while that I was picking up on was that his principal skill was as a communicator. So that was the thing that I, I wasn't really being mentored in the business of classical music or musical performance from this particular mentor. And this, frankly, this guy was the principal mentor in my life. And sadly, just a few years ago, he died. But what, what I was being mentored in was the business of communicating. And all of my educational development, all of my musical training fed into that. And when from about, uh, like I say, when I moved from, the, from a major city, what I found was that I was really attuned to the critical business of communication and the, 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 the limited time, the opportunity in an interaction, in, a, in a, uh, an ensemble leading or a group education, whatever, um, transaction, the limitations on the the time, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but the kind of packages of time that you're afforded to communicate whatever the hell it is that you want to communicate. So that business of engaging at whatever level, and I'm not talking about hierarchical stuff here with level, but whatever level where you could, you could, effective, that had to be done with concise honest, genuine, engaging human connection and communication. And for me, that was the guts of the training in community music facilitation. Excellent. Now, that, that kind of um, leads on and kind of starts to answer the next question, which is, what does training mean to you in the context of community music? Now, the thing that I'm interested to I ask about is you mentioned training with a small t earlier yeah. so I'm kind yeah. of wondering is there also a training with a big t in your head somewhere in that conversation as well I reckon there is and something that I'm real and to say something down plays plays it the thing here we go this is very grandiose for you at this time of the morning the thing that I'm really passionate about is what I would what I would consider to be informed, inclusive um, community music leadership training, and what and so I think therefore that gets a big T that one that gets a big T. The paradox is I did not receive such training, and I think 
I believe I have enough passion for it, not enough knowledge, but enough passion for it to be able to kind of identify something that might be meaningful in that domain. That's what I'm hoping anyway, Chris. But <laughs> so I think that's that big T training exists. I think what's critical about it, there are a few elements there. I think there are four elements actually, but I think what's critical is the human connection and in terms of appropriateness that has to be monitored, monitored throughout, throughout whatever that big tree training is, the thing that has, to, um, that has to support it all the way through for those people who, who, who can, can do this training is, uh, it's not just humility, it's that essential confident um, communication. So the big T training, I think there needs to be training around group pedagogy, regardless of the cohort, group pedagogy or andragogy, you know, if you want andragogy to be part of that, you know, the, the umbrella of pedagogy. That's, that's got to be a part of it. I think there's an element of entrepreneurship that also has to be part of that big T training. The ability to the ability to take the cohort, whatever the cohort is, to take the cohort into uh, a place, a domain, an area where there's affirmation for what for the music making that's being done. So that's the entrepreneurship piece, I think. Um, artistic performance. I think we, I believe that we as uh, facilitators or leaders in, in community music or inclusive music making, I believe that it's a, I believe that it is performance. I don't think, I think while it is for everyone, including me, therapeutic, I think it's, I think it's, I think that therapeutic effect comes from the performative aspect, right? I also think that communication and advocacy is part of that big T training. And that's because, yeah, well, that's, I think maybe that's apparent. If not, I'm happy to talk more about that. But I think that those things, I think those things have to be part of the, the training. Um, it's also practical experience, I believe. It's, uh, yeah, it's practical experience. Part of that training has definitely got to be the doing of it. Uh, and what else do I think? Yeah, I think that's enough for now. Yeah. So it, that the the kind of little T and the big T. It, what, what are the kind of balances there? What it, is is one more important than the other, or, or are they well balanced in your opinion? I think they can be well balanced. I really do think they can be well balanced. Um, I'm going to cop out a little bit here and say that. When you see, when we see a trainer more than, and I'm not going to use the big E word, educator, but a trainer at work juggling those elements at the same time, when we see that, we know, I believe, quality training because those elements of the pedagogy, the entrepreneurship, the artistic performance, the communication advocacy, um, we see those being applied um, in a practical or with the practical the practical experience of um, the, the the activity. We know it, and I think the trainees, if you like, I think I I believe they need to see those things integrated and those things um, activated all in a flow. Um, so I think. I think there I think there definitely can be balance. I don't think we're talking about a whole lot of classroom time for that big T training at all. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, there can't be any of that, but I do think that the practical element, the demonstrating, the experiencing, I think it's critical. That's great. I, I, I suppose for me the thing that I'm always interested in is I, I always want to very much uh, combine the small T and the big T in, in yeah. the way you're describing it. That it's not, I, I suppose I want to lose that sort of definition of the two so that we always prepare the two together, that we always understand maybe it's some sort of cycle that one supports the other. So it's, it's great to hear that kind of 
idea about that balance and, and how that works. So just moving on a little bit, um, through the TTCM symposiums that's happened um, both in 2019 and 2020, some of the themes that come through were both about the advantages of training community musicians, but also the dangers of training community musicians. And I wondered what your thoughts were about what are the advantages and dangers of training community musicians? This is beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. It's great there's, that there's that tension there because it keeps it exciting and it keeps us excited and keeps us thinking about it. Okay, so what I would understand or perceive about the notional dangers of the training, this is just my understanding, right? I think I think of that as, as there being a suggestion that the training might might take the experience or it might take the process away from um, the the experience, right? That it, that it might be removing, uh, coming away from the experiential thing that maybe is heading more towards the educational process away from the training, away from the experiential process. That's my understanding of the danger. Um, I think there, I think when it comes to the benefits, the caveat for me is confidence has to be part of it. Now, if there's a default in the the okay, if we're think if we're thinking about, well, I, I want to make I want to be clear about this. If we're thinking, if we're thinking that there are benefits in in not training but just doing to the point of then I don't know, you know, coming from the coming from the experience to to the to the the leadership. What I would be fearful of, what I'm fearful of is is confidence not developing. So I think again, coming back to training, there needs to be the facilitator, you know, in a community or inclusive music uh, environment, that person needs to feel confident in the tools that they're using. For me, I think training can, can um, provide the right Dodgy, dodgy concept coming up here, but the right training can ensure that there is confidence in the leadership. And that is utterly key because every person in a cohort, every participant in a community music activity needs to know that they are being led with confidence and that when they leave the room and they're doing whatever it is, that they feel that they're not getting a secondhand or apologetic um, version of, of music participation. For me, that's absolutely key. So if we go up the tree a little, if we can, if I can dare to use some sort of hierarchical um, or, or sort of vertical, um, uh, uh, you know, reference here, that at every point, the musical experience is confident and valid. Therefore, the leader or the facilitator needs to feel that whatever tools, if they're playing chords on the guitar, they need to not think I can barely get away with this or I hope no one realizes that, you know, this is all I can do on the guitar. You know what I mean? Or when they're singing, they need to feel that they're totally confident, whether they feel that they're a singer or not, you know, those things. I see that sort of slightly apologetic or slightly embarrassed approach way too frequently. That doesn't mean I see it a lot, but whenever I see it, it's too frequently. So I would, I believe that training can exist, that affirms and that communicates and delivers confidence in the learning or training facilitator. So I may not have answered your question then, but I blathered on for quite a while. No, I, I really, I really like that idea of confidence. Um, that there's been a lot, I've had a lot of discussions recently with students and with colleagues about the vulnerability that we feel as community musicians, you know, that that aspect of the adaptability and flexibility we need in the room that, you know, that thing that we need to drop what we're doing and change and move direction if it works for our participants. But yep. in 
the thing is that takes a vulnerability, but as you say, it takes a, an extreme confidence to do that as well. And I suppose for me, it's how do you develop a confidence alongside the ability to be vulnerable at the same time? And, and it's that, that kind of paradox of putting the two together and, and how we work with that. So I really, I really appreciate that, that thought about confidence and how we build it and yeah. where it's needed. So no, that's, that's great. That's great. So I think I just, I just, sorry, yeah. just to carry a little bit with the vulnerability. I think vulnerability is magnificent. Vulnerability is a wonderful thing to face and it's a wonderful thing to, it's a wonderful thing to connect on the basis of, I mean, you know, like this barely, this barely deserves being said, but you know, even like musicians or I don't even want to use, I want to be careful about what terms I use, but practitioners, artists, whatever, who are, you know, um, traditionally identified as experts, you know, wherever the hell they are, every single one of them is vulnerable in some way at some point. I think we have, we, we need to be able to join, we need to be able to, you know, join with others in that vulnerability not just own it, but appreciate that that's part of, in fact, that's an essential part of us connecting as human beings. So training should be able to help us to, to, to kind of um, tease that out. And this is a hackneyed thing to say, I'm afraid, get ready, prepare, hang on to whatever. But um, it's, it's a benefit, right? We need to celebrate the vulnerability. Yeah. And then we can pack it, we can, we can sort of then find the confidence. And the thing that worries me in my environment, right, and it may only be mine, but what worries me is the vulnerability of programs when they are being led by, you know, leaders or practitioners or teachers or whatever, who don't carry that seem or that basis of confidence, I worry for programs being vulnerable. That's what worries me. So I think successful community music activities, successful um, musically inclusive activities rest on good leadership. That leadership rests on sure expertise and insight, but equally confidence equally in my mind and then below that comes those things that i've talked about so that's why i think training leadership training is really important because i think otherwise um, a consequence can be programs dropping off or there being you know vulnerability in the programs does does that kind of i hope that's in some way sort of cogent yeah 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 it makes a lot of sense thank you so um, our last question um, for you today as part of this conversation is if all community musicians had to develop three attributes or skills, what would they be? If you could just distill it down to three. I've got a wee idea of where you might go with this <laughs> conversation. I think we need I'm to afraid nail I, this one to the post. I may not disappoint you with these three. <laughs> Here's something I prepared earlier. Not exactly true, but I'm a little bit boring in that way. Um, I have my hobby horse, you may have noticed. But those three attributes. Now tell me if, if this is if this is too vague, but the three are expertise, insight. I'm saying them slowly because I feel they're profound, right? And confidence. There it is. For me, for me, that's what it is. Yeah. I, I, do you know, I, I like it because I, I, a couple of them you could really unpack and we could talk about. But actually, I, I think one of the things that that issue of expertise is a big one for me. And it's it's not just the expertise of being in the room, but it's the expertise about getting yourself into the room. And I think that's one of the things that insight for me, and I love that connection between the two brings, because I'm always saying to our students here, you know, we can spend all this time getting you ready to be in a room, but we also need to give you the skills to get yourself into it. And that connects back to that thing about entrepreneurship from earlier. You know, um, I've seen so many amazing practitioners not make it because 
no one stopped and said, this is how you find your funding and this is how you get yourself in there. So that, I really like that idea of expertise and, and the vagueness that's there because you can explore it in so many ways. But I think sometimes as community musicians and I, I can just hear people shuffling in their chairs as I say what I'm about to say, is we often, people often see a community musician as sort of a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I think a lot of people perceive it that way because we're seen to be able to do it such a broad range of things. But there's an expertise in being able to be a jack of all trades and do it well with insight. Absolutely. With Absolutely. So I really love, yeah. Yeah, really love those. My story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And look, uh, it, it is unashamedly expertise. It's yeah. unashamedly expertise. There's nothing expert in somebody who's up to Busy Fingers book 15, you know, churny sort of last stand. There's nothing expert about that person coming into the room. You know what I'm saying, right? There's yeah. nothing expert about that. So um, yeah, great, absolutely. Yeah, excellent. So I, I, that's great, Graham. Thank you so much. It's one of the real pleasures for me about doing these conversations are, are hearing so many different perspectives in the way we look at this profession. And, you know, community music is a profession that, that I'm so passionate about, but I'm also frustrated by constantly <laughs> on a daily basis. You know, in, in, all of, in all of these debates and conversations, but I think it's a, a privilege to be able to kind of go through it. So thank you so much for your time today. Chris, it's a real pleasure. You may have guessed that. And any opportunity I have to get on my hobby horse, um, I will do it. Uh, community music and inclusive music practice is uh, like at my, at my point of life, you know, X years down the track, all of my formal training, all of my connection, all of my study, all of that has brought me to this joyful place um, and has given what I do absolute meaning. So this has been an absolute pleasure. As always, Chris, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks very much. Thank you.